Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And if you would like to have the notes and don't have any, just go ahead and raise your hand if you didn't get a hard copy, if you'd like one. And then the ushers will um, get them to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's pray. Father, we, <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your presence. Father, we say that your nearness, Lord, is our good. Father, we ask in the next few moments, Lord, that your spirit, Lord, would continue to connect our spirit, Lord, with your heart in that manifest and in that experiential way. And Lord, that you would open up our eyes, Father, to your law. You who are the God of mercies and the God of all comfort. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you and... Um, want to know the bottom line of what I want to say to us this morning is that if you, uh, which I would assume many of us are, that if you are in pain, hurting, uh, confused, sad, I want to tell you it is okay. You're having a human experience. In fact, this issue of pain is so part of the human experience. The thing that is so amazing, as I've been thinking about this, is that the Word became flesh. That God came into our human experience and embraced the pain that is so central to the human experience. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. Just the thought that he came and he embraced our humanity. It, it gives us confidence that we can go to him knowing that he will not turn us aside. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to, uh, chapter 4, verses 7 to 8, Paul, uh, in fact, actually the whole book of 2 Corinthians is Paul talking about a tremendous pressure that is coming against him and his apostolic team. Now, in that particular context, the, the, uh, the trouble and the pressure that is coming against him is specifically related to a persecution for the gospel. That is not the situation that we are dealing with um, in this season. But it is pain nonetheless. The, the principles that Paul highlights in passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 4 or even Romans 8, they have profound insight for us in terms of how it is that we can uh, carry our hearts in the place of pain, in the place of confusion, and how to interact with the Lord in the midst of all of that. So Paul tells us here that, but we have this treasure, and the treasure that Paul is talking about here is the glory of God. It is the, uh, the very power of God, the very presence of God, the very love of God, the very essence of who he is, lives inside of us. That's the treasure that Paul is talking about. And he says that we carried it in earthen vessels. We, 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 we are carriers of his glory in the fullness of our humanity. And we can, and we can bring the fullness of our humanity, our, our human experience, in interacting with the Lord. And then Paul gives a reason. He says, here's why. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God. In short, because God is actually doing something. That if we respond properly in the way that we embrace pain, the way that we acknowledge it, and the way that we engage him, and then the way that we engage one another, Paul tells us that there is a manifestation of the power of God. And by the power of God, meaning where the, the life of Christ begins to get formed inside of us in a, in, a, in a very powerful way. And he says this, he says that we are hard pressed or afflicted in every way, but not crushed. That because of the presence of God in us, we can experience insurmountable pressures, as it were, but because of that treasure within us, 
it doesn't have to crush us. We can't have the, the feelings and the experience of perplexity, but we don't have to drown in despair. So I want to talk this morning about what I'm calling the paradox of pain-filled faith. Pain-filled faith. Again, we're in a time of uh, great pressure as a spiritual family. And I want to reiterate that the IPKC leadership takes this situation and the allegations seriously. And we're laboring with focus until we have a complete thorough examination of the allegations and the inquiry of the circumstances. Paragraph B, this crisis, however, again, it understandably, and I, and I cannot underscore this enough, that uh, it under, understandably stirs up various internal, relational, as well as spiritual pressures in this hour. And when there is a crisis many questions begin to arise in the midst of that in our hearts and in our emotions. And some of these questions, they are related to what is the nature and the origin of the circumstances? You know, what did we know? What did we not know? How come we didn't know? I mean, just all of these questions, should we have known? Who is God in terms of his leadership? And is there a purpose? Is there a purpose to, uh, to the pain? Is there a purpose to the crisis? Is there a meaning to this? What is this all about? Again, when we are filled with pressure, paragraph C, our hearts are filled with all sorts of questions mixed with an inflaming inward manifestation of pain. There are moments where for some of you, it is sustained pain. Uh, for some of you, it is a pain that comes in waves. For some of you, it's, you don't have it for a while, and then all of a sudden, it hits you. You wake up in the middle of the night, and you find yourself experiencing this dynamic. And so there's questions, but there are deeply inflamed inward manifestations of pain that come along with it. But well, here's what's important, is that this pain must not be too quickly dismissed or classified as weak faith. I'll say this again. That the questions and the pain, it is very important that we don't quickly classify it as weak faith. I would like to put before you that rather that the pain and the questions are rather evidence of a history of fervent belief. I'll say this again. It is a manifestation. It is an evidence of fervent belief. But we're faced now with the inability to reconcile what is believed along with what is happening. We see this in the scripture often. The Psalms are filled with it. The prophets are filled with it. Where we see these individuals bringing questions to the Lord. And if we're not careful, uh, we can conclude that they're having a crisis of faith. But the truth is they're not having a crisis of faith. It is actually their belief in the nature of God. It is actually their belief in the character of God. It is actually their belief in the promises of God. They believe it so fervently that they can't make sense of if that being true, then why are these things happening in the, in the natural? And, it, and it's creating a disconnect. And so that, that's why I call it pain-filled faith. It's not a shaking of faith. It is actually because of faith that these questions are emerging. One of the primary things that lies before us when there's pain and trials is that we are dealing with 
an eternal purpose that is before us, which is this, is that the Father, he desires to forge and conform us into the image of his Son. Again, Romans 8, as I mentioned earlier, is a chapter that, again, it's a chapter that actually deals with pain and suffering. And Paul says in verse 29 of Romans 8, he says that, that God predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son. And the reason is, is so that his son would have an inheritance. Or in the language that we've used over the years, that the son would have an equally yoked bride, a people that are filled with the character of Christ, filled with the wisdom of Christ, filled with the power of Christ. The thing that's important is that we want to orient and relate and face our pain, disappointment, confusion, anger, sadness. We, we want to engage it through the truth of the Scriptures. Paragraph E, um, you know, I believe that, again, you know, pain is a part of life. The, the world is filled with an insane amount of pain. And so there's, fa- there's pain because we live in a fallen world. There's pain because of our sin. There's pain because of the sins of others. And yet, one of the things that lies before us as things are still going to unfold, how many of you know that regardless of what is happening in our midst right now, that what the Scripture said is still true about the days that lie ahead, the the great pressure that is coming, on the earth. And so we have an opportunity uh, to not waste our trials, but to let it, under the Lord's leadership, forge something on the inside. But here's our challenge. Our challenge is that, in my opinion, one of the great weaknesses in the Western discipleship is the lack of a robust theology of pain, of how to embrace pain and how to face pain and, and how to interact with pain and how, and how we have a relationship with pain, if I can say it that way. And how to face negative emotions. Here's a key thing. How do we face negative emotions by acknowledging them without shame. Let me say this again. One of the greatest weaknesses in Western Christian discipleship is a lack of a robust theology of pain and how to face negative emotions by acknowledging them without shame and bringing them before the Lord. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. In fact, I want to get a little bit more personal since it's us. One of the things that I have heard um, over the years, and it actually um, saddens me actually when I hear it, is the amount of people that have left our community for various reasons. And they almost invariably preface their departure with this sentence. I want you to know that I'm not angry. And that speaks of several things. But I want you to know that anger is a human experience. Uh, There's no shame in the experience of anger. Again, it's part of the human experience. And the challenge with this is, is that if there's shame associated with anger, 
we begin, to be, we begin to do several things. Number one, we do everything in our power to avoid it, which is an exercise of absolute futility. Number one, that it touches us and that we deny it. And then we face others who are faced with their pain and we're very quick to tell them to get over it. And all this is because when people run into their humanity and they interface with us, guess what? We run to our humanity. <laughs> it's incredibly uncomfortable. But remember, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He embraced humanity and he became acquainted with sorrow and grief, like it says in Isaiah. Another example is offense. You know, it's the goal for many to not be offended. I'm telling you that right now, it is an exercise in futility. The goal is to not, not get offended. The goal is to not stay offended. Trust me, this week, I've been offended quite a few times. As recent as last night, some things that anger me. Things that offend me. And I get home in the evening, I interact with my wife, and then I go to my quiet place to go work it out without shame because I'm having a human experience. There is a way forward in this. We want to bring them before the Lord and not be so quick to talk others out of it, but to stand with them. The Bible gives us many examples of the prophets and their relationship with negative emotions. You know, the the thing that's amazing is that the scripture invites us to come boldly before the throne of grace. We know the verse in Hebrews chapter four, therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. I'm about to tell you my favorite, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm about to tell you my favorite Greek word, and it's right here in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. It's the word confidence. We come with confidence before the throne of grace. The word confidence in Greek, it's the word parousia. It means confidence. It is, as it were, the first amendment of the kingdom of God. It literally means this. It, it refers to a sense of permission to be outspoken before the Lord and to speak with frankness to him without fear of repercussions or judgment. That where we can speak to him freely about the thing that's on our hearts and on our minds. But in order to do that, we have to change um, our relationship with pain. Our pain and the pain of those around us. I think one of the things that's beautiful about um, our community is that we have uh, a, a wide variety of cultures, international cultures. And um, each culture has a different relationship with pain. And it would be absolutely stunning if we would have, could have an environment where we could have that relationship in the gospel and find our way forward in truth. The key to confidence, the key to parousia, the key to um, being free to speak whatever's on our minds. In particular, when it comes to negative emotions, in fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that we're to draw near with this parousia, with this first amendment of the kingdom. Here it is, so that we may receive mercy and find grace or power to help in a time of need. 
We are in a time of need. Our hearts, our minds, our community, our relationship. And by the way, when I'm saying our, I'm referring to everyone involved in this. In some way, form, or shape. We're all in tremendous amount of pain. But the Lord has mercy for us. And he has grace for us. But the writer tells us that this grace is found when we exercise our freedom of speech before the throne. And we come before the Lord with honesty. And we ask him for help. Paragraph G, the, the and, um, uh, oh, sorry, that the, the key to this is understanding that we have a sympathetic high priest, that Jesus in his humanity, he experienced all manner of pressure, and yet he was without sin. So he can show us the way forward in righteousness. The paradox of pain-filled faith allows us to experience pressure, number one. Number two, it allows us to see our inner um, bankruptcy unto a deep engagement with the Lord and with one another. I want to encourage us that this is a time to do three very basic things, uh, to turn to the Lord, to turn to our families, and to turn to our friends. Now, when we turn to the Lord and to our families and to our friends, we don't turn to commiserate. But we turn to be comforted in truth and in true Christian fellowship. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, in this verse, um, I've coined this phrase called the law of comfort. And the law of comfort is that we will comfort others with the very thing that brings us comfort. That's how comfort works. We will comfort others with the very thing that has brought us comfort. And here's what Paul says. He talks about the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Here's what he does. Number one, he comforts us. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, they want to comfort us. And that comfort comes as we turn to them. And I think that's amazing is that when we turn to the Lord, sometimes the comfort comes in that place of turning to him. And sometimes the comfort comes by someone knocking on your door and saying something to you. This morning, a brother came to me and said, hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. That's the Lord bringing me comfort in response to having turned to him for comfort. And he has many, so many creative ways of how he moves in through um, his people to bring comfort. Sometimes he does it in that intense crisis Holy Spirit encounter, that Shanda Mahandai moment, which we all love. But then there's moments when he just does it as the word became flesh, a dwelling among us, and he uses his body to bring us words of life and strength and encouragement. So he's the God of comfort. He wants to comfort us. And again, when I'm saying us, I'm saying everyone that's involved. There's lots of people involved. Number one. Number two, he says that he comforts us, but as he comforts us, he's actually equipping us to be a comfort to others. The Father of mercy, the God of all comfort, who comforts us, that we may be able to comfort. But notice that our ability to bring comfort to others comes from having been comforted by the Lord. Let's go to page two. Earthen vessels. Again, the, the humanizing experience of pain. Dr. Cornell West, a philosopher, he, he speaks of the idea of humanity that comes from the Latin word humando. 
which contains actually this idea of a burial. And the truth is that as humans, we are on a journey towards death. And that part of the human experience is that there is pain and death. Not just the death that we experience at the end of our life, but that our whole journey in this life is marked with pain and death. Pain and death. And this is one of the reasons why there is such tremendous news in the book of Revelation. And it says there will be no more sorrow in other words, no more pain, no more death. The death of the new that will, that will cease to exist in the New Jerusalem is not just the, the physical death, but it's the dying. Like, like even, beloved, like even right now, unfortunately, there are relationships that are dying. And hopefully, in the grace of God, the, the resurrection power of Christ that's in us will bring healing and restoration. But but our, our lives, the part of the human experience that we cannot ignore, we cannot, uh, we cannot push aside, we cannot be dismissive of, is marked by pain and death. It's what it means to be human. The experience of pain is a profoundly human experience. And to dismiss it and to deny it or to ignore it is profoundly dehumanizing. Whether we do it to others or worse, whether we do it to ourselves. It is human to be in pain. So we got to go easy on ourselves. Some of you have been with the Lord for a while and and you go, man, I mean, I should be past this. Because part of the charismatic theology, it's indirect, it's hinted at, is that we come in a place in life where the pain is gone. And, and that doesn't exist at all. I would argue that the longer the journey gets, the greater the pain. The more intensifying of the human experience. In fact, that is part of what happens in the process of redemption is that as we are, are uh, part of the born-again experience is actually to make us all the more human, thus bringing us into the greater experience of pain. Here's what the psalmist says. He says, just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I love this. For he himself knows our frame, and he's mindful that we are but dust, that we're but humans. His compassion on us in the midst of our pain. In other words, go easy on yourself. Paul taught the Corinthians that when we embrace pain and allow it to turn us to the Lord, it will result in the experience of the life of God in our inner being as well as to those around us. Here's how he said it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 12, he says, always caring about the body, the dying of, in our body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Verse 12, so death works in us, but life in you. That as we embrace the pain and we turn it into fellowship with the Lord, that first amendment of the kingdom, asking him for mercy and for grace in a time of need, his life begins to get manifested in our bodies. But not only that, that the more we embrace the pain, the, 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 uh, the working of that death, it will also result in life to those that are around us. In crisis and in this crisis, it's no different. Again, it is normal to have various painful emotional dynamics. And they can be disorienting and they can be very difficult to navigate. But again, it means that you are human. 
What are some of these emotions? The sense of just being overwhelmed. In other words, the inability to consolidate the information at a right pace in order to access peace. The information just comes so fast. Now, Dr. Brown uh, made a statement um, last Sunday and he urged people to shut down uh, the social media. Man, that created an uproar. People are all mad about that. You know, so, let, so let me say this. Do whatever you want, okay? Do, no, for real. Just do whatever you want, okay? And, and, and just, and, and they, but I want to say this. You control the amount of information that comes your way, and then, but know this, that if you're overwhelmed, it means you got too much information coming your way and you're unable to process it. Number two, confusion, where you're unable to reconcile a new reality with a past um, expectation of the future. In other words, none of us imagined November 12, 2023 to look the way it looked today. We had an entirely different expectation. And we're unable to reconcile this new reality. And go, oh, what's happened over here? It's a profoundly human experience. Anger. The inability to experience stability due to either the perception or the reality of injustice and lack of accountability. That creates anger in the human heart. Sadness. It's the inability to hope, to see a certain future. But again, these are all very normal human experiences. You are human. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paragraph D. And so the experience of inner turmoil, again, is deeply human. It does not mean that your faith is weak or that your faith is not intact. If you have these feelings, the ones I just talked about, it does not mean that your faith in God is shaken. But it does mean this. It means that there is an increased opportunity to move from death to life and grow towards lasting peace. Jesus says that I give you peace, but not as the world does. Where we can grasp what is taking place and through discernment rooted in love, we have an increased perspective where we begin to develop a viewpoint that comes from the scripture. Thirdly, this, this is a big one. This is a really, really big one. And, I, and unfortunately, I'm going to say this, and I know what's going to happen. I'm going to get misunderstood for being dismissive, but, you know, like I said, twice now, this will be the third time. I ain't worried about saying the right thing. No, I just can't. I just, I want to sleep at night. It's just too stressful to figure out what the right thing is. I want to, I want to say the faithful thing. I want to be faithful. And there are people that are near me, part of the leadership team, friends, family that, trust me, they won't hesitate to, you know, send me the tweet, the, the, the text. And I welcome it. The rest of you, just calm down, please. <laughs> but here it is. Confidence in Jesus' judgment and timing, whether in this age or the age to come. All things end in judgment. I want to say this again. All Things end in judgment. The book, the book of Ecclesiastes makes that very, very clear. And all things end in judgment. Nobody will get away with anything. All things end in judgment. You know, I read a verse the other day that bugged me. And that's how you know you're reading the Bible. If you've read the Bible 
and you cannot remember the last time it bugged you, you're probably not reading it properly. But this is literally what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, why don't you just let yourself be cheated? <laughs> it's like, excuse me? Yeah, just let yourself be wrong. He goes, just leave it be. You're like, what in the world are you talking about, Paul? And again, it sounds dismissive, but that's not what Paul was saying. Paul was operating from this, conf- from this place of confidence that says that all things end in judgment. If not in this age, in the age to come. This issue of all things ending in judgment is significant, back to paragraph C, to help us overcome anger. Anger is often rooted in the perception that there is no accountability and that there's no accountability coming. I'm going to give them a little qualifier, but I'm not saying that as a leadership team, we're not committed to accountability. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that it says in 1 Corinthians 4 that it thinks accountability and judgment land in the right time. Fourth, Increased, increased opportunity for a further aligning with God's future. I want to say this, folks. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay because this is not our show. It's his. Either, he's, either he is able to bring into completion what he has started or he's not. This is his deal, not ours. And you know what? And even if it doesn't work out, guess what? what here's what we know for sure. We're going to look like Jesus. <laughs> Lastly, had the worship team come up. A greater rooting and anchoring in Christ and his love. That's the opportunity that lies before us to root ourselves in the love of Christ, to anchor ourselves in the love of Christ, and then to share in that love with our friends and with our families. Let's stand. Father, help us. Help us, Lord. Let's just stand before the Lord. This is going to take just a short moment just to, just to worship the Lord, just to take a moment and respond to the Lord. And even now, even just take that opportunity to say to, say to the Lord what you've not wanted to say. You're carrying it. But exercise that first amendment, right of the kingdom, the parousia, the ability to be frank with the Lord without fear of repercussions or judgment. I don't know how many times in my walk with the Lord I said, Lord, I know this is not the right attitude, but here it is. And then I've said it, and then I said, okay, now help me. Help me. Have mercy on me. Help me. Talk to the Lord. Help, Lord. Lord, this hurts. It's infuriating. It's confusing. I know you're good. 
frankly, I don't really see it manifesting a whole lot right now, but I know who you are. Would you help me? Help us. Jesus, give.